Hello, everyone. Hey, welcome. Good to see you. Hope you all are doing well. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've started the uh, recording, and we'll go ahead and get started with today's session. Um, let's just, let's pray. Let's start. Okay. Father, we we come before you. We come to your throne of grace. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and uh, take control over this session, over this hour. Lord, we uh, I pray that we would be sensitive to the leading of your voice. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that I would be sensitive to the leading of your voice, Lord. I thank you for everything that you've been teaching us on ministering, healing, and deliverance. Lord, I pray that even as we continue to learn, we will be equipped and empowered, uh, Lord, to reveal the love of the Father to the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I hope I'm audible. Um, just thumbs up. All right. This is not so good. Okay. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you hear me? Yes, Pastor, you're audible. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sarvashesh. Uh, all right, then. Okay, well, let's get started. So let's do a quick recap. Um, uh, we finished at chapter five um, the week before. Um, you know, we covered chapter four and chapter five. In, in chapter four, we looked at uh, you know, uh, learning to minister in healing and deliverance, right? We, talk, um, we kind of touched some of the topics on, on the will of God, understanding the will of God. We even asked the question, is it, is it God's will to heal people? And is it a right to pray, um, you know, uh, saying that if it's your will, heal this person and so on. So, uh, you know, we learned that and uh, the exercise of faith, how to flow in compassion, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we address the issue of sin and salvation um, and then methods Jesus used uh, to minister healing and deliverance. Right? And uh, in chapter five, um, titled The Secret to Ministry as Demonstrated by Jesus. That is, uh, learning from his life and how he went about, uh, you know, demonstrating healing and deliverance. Uh, we, the first thing we, we saw was that he ministered out of intimacy and obedience, right? Uh, he ministered out of intimacy and obedience, right? That has to be... Um, uh, we all need to strive for something uh, like that, right? To live life out of intimacy. And that bears the fruit of obedience, right? And both, and both of them are a fruit of love, in a sense, right? And you're saying, I love him. That's why I want to spend this time with him and get to know him intimately. And because, therefore, I love him, and because, therefore, I know him intimately, I want to obey him, right? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, he does not just, he's not demanding, but he's command, he commands your love, right? Uh, there's a difference between commanding and demanding, isn't it? Uh, and so Jesus flowed from a place of intimacy and obedience. And the second thing we see how he demonstrated was he uh, he he demonstrated knowing uh, that what he was going to accomplish on the cross, right? He functioned on the basis of the finished work of the cross, and then he functioned on the place of domain from the place of dominion and authority, right? Dominion and authority, and I'm sure you guys uh, or uh, you know you all are learning. Uh, I think there's a class that you are doing on believers' authority, right? Um, and so we, we would, all, you know, we all know that we've been given this authority, and we are expected to function out of that place of authority, dominion, as sons and daughters of God, right? Okay. And then finally, in conclusion, we saw that uh, ministering through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's how Jesus demonstrated um, the, the healing ministry, right? Uh, by through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
okay? Um, it's the same Holy Spirit that is made available to you and me. And how many times have we uh, heard that uh, you know, this semester in this course? Right? The same Holy Spirit that ministered and flowed through Jesus that came and rested on him as a dove is available for you and me. The same Holy Spirit uh, that raised Jesus from the dead is made available for you and me. Right? Um, just thinking about it, um, it, it should it, it should mean something, right? It should inspire us, uh, you know, motivate us to, to go and minister in, in healing and deliverance because it's made available, right, for you and me. Uh, so that, that that's been the emphasis. Right? We are, um, one of the foundations of this course is every believer can do this. Right? And every believer can do this because of the Holy Spirit that is available for us, that who lives inside us, and he wants to flow out like a, like a river through us. Okay? Um, so those were, uh, the, the, we, we concluded uh, the previous session with uh, chapter 5. Okay? And I hope you've learned quite a few, because um, um, I'm also learning, uh, as you are learning. Okay? Um, but otherwise, everybody doing all right? Everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay. Right. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, now let's uh, go to chapter six in your PDFs. It's, it's page ninety four. Right. Page ninety four. In this chapter, we're going to try and answer uh, some of the common questions um, that on sickness and healing, right? And again, once again, please bear in mind that uh, this is not an exhaustive list of questions. However, uh, you know, it's free, most of the frequently asked questions have been put together in this chapter, and we are going to uh, look at a few of them and um, see what it says, right? So, um, Share the screen. So I guess it's very good. Oh, sorry, wrong. Okay. okay. Um, right, chapter six answers to common questions on sickness and healing. Um, what is it saying? So, um, there are several passages in the Bible that are often misunderstood and used as a basis for tolerating sickness and the other demonic works, okay? Uh, the foundation is, uh, there are several passages, right, um, in the Bible that are misunderstood, and uh, sermons are preached on, uh, which talks about tolerating sickness uh, and other demonic works, okay? So, uh, in this chapter, we look at some of these and provide insight on understanding Okay, we must keep in mind that all the scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of the scripture. Okay, and we again learned this in chapter one, right? That all the scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of the scripture and in the light of the person of Jesus Christ, right? Everything we know about. God must align itself to what is seen and heard through God who became flesh, Jesus Christ. Okay? Everything we know about God must align no, okay, itself to what is seen and heard 
through the life of Jesus. Okay, every every scripture that we read, uh, you know, every confusing or contradictory scripture that you think might be and uh, hard, difficult scriptures to understand, etc., uh, etc. Et All of that has to be interpreted in line and in the light of person of Jesus Christ, because He is the Word who became flesh. Right. So He is the Word who became flesh. Okay. So. Um, Based on all of that, and not just for this chapter, but every, you know, any, any, uh, everything that you do, like your personal Bible studies, um, you know, preparing a sermon or teaching, a, teaching a small group, youth group, teenage group, so whatever. And right? I think um, it's an uh, it's an absolute uh, important foundation to make sure that you interpret scripture in the light uh, of all the other scriptures, and in the, especially in the light. Of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so uh, here we go. So the first question, uh, a frequently asked question, uh, is regarding Paul's thorn, right? Paul's thorn, and uh, we all know, you know, what we're referring to, and we've also heard, uh, you know, um, people using references such as uh, he, 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 you know. Uh, that's the thorn in my flesh. Uh, he is being a thorn in my flesh. She is being a thorn in my flesh. Uh, yeah, yada yada. Right? You, we've we've all heard those uh, references. I have. Okay. We hear what hear what it says. Let's see what it says. Um, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. By the abundance of the revelations, please note that, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Okay, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in need, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay. Um, you you kind of see there how it can be uh, kind of misunderstood in terms of saying tolerating. Uh, it's like, okay, you know, it must be his will, and I'll just go on with it, kind of thing. But when you look at it, this verse here, right, the messenger of Satan, okay, the messenger here it says a, a Greek word used there is angelos, okay, um, angelos. So it simply means uh, a messenger, right? Um, so that's he's an associate of angel. Of, of the devil, right, the demon, uh, who was trying to buffet Paul. So what does that mean, to buffet, meaning to keep striking repeatedly, okay, to keep striking, to keep attacking him repeatedly. Now, uh, and, and we see that in, in um, where Paul writes extensively in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 and 27, Okay, uh, it says here, are they ministers of Christ? I speak of as a fool, I am more. In laborers, in labors more abundant, in stripes have uh, above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of, in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Right. Um, so you see, in Second Corinthians, Paul is just uh, you know referring a little bit to all the hardships, to uh, all you know, all the things that the Satan was trying to buffet him. Right, it's being strike 
repeatedly um, over and over and over again. Uh, now, all of this, we okay, so we understand the source. It's very clear. A messenger of Satan. Okay, a messenger of Satan is attacking uh, Paul in everything that he does. And he's referring to that as the thorn in the flesh. Okay, but what is very important here, um, what uh, was also written in this book is, uh, what we need to make sure, it, uh, try and highlight is, is regarding this, about the measure by the abundance of the revelations. Abundance of the revelation. So what is he talking about? Right? Uh, Paul wrote almost like more than half of the New Testament. I'm saying more, right? 13, 14 epistles. That's almost three-fourths, right? Of the New Testament. Uh, and, and that's the kind of revelation that he's talking about, the abundance of revelation. And all of that was, which was put into, uh, which, which is now what we call it uh, as the canon, of, of the God's scripture, okay? Um, and we, we we do get revelations. Now God speaks to us through us, but not, not the same revelations that Paul is referring to, okay? And so that in mind says, as believers today, none of us have received such abundance of revelations in which, in, in, on the same note that Paul has encountered, right? We have not been used in the same manner as Paul to have the privilege of being of being given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of our Satan to buffet us, to keep us humble. Further, to us to claim that our sickness is a thorn in the flesh given to us from grand spiritual purpose is rather unscriptural and self-exalting. Okay, please note this. For us to claim that our sickness is a thorn in the flesh, given to us for a grand spiritual purpose, is rather unscriptural and self-exalting. So we must fight sickness as a work of the devil that has no right in our bodies. Okay, so thorn in the flesh, when it comes to, when, if anybody is referring to that, and if you misunderstood it, now we understand. Okay, so it's the abundance of revelation that Paul received. And then Satan wanted to just you know, stop. And, and we see that you know, Satan doing that time and time again, isn't it? In another believer's life. And even as, like, let's just take even Jesus' life for that matter. When Jesus says, let's cross and go to the other side of the lake. Jesus is very clearly explain, expressing his will. Let us go to the other side of the lake. right? And then who brings the storm? And so we know that story as well. So, um, so that's the answer to the first question or frequently asked question regarding Paul's thorn. Now we know the reason, the source, and, and the why. Okay. And the second frequently asked question is Job's life. Okay. Once again, guys, I mean, every time, how many, how many of you have heard, you know, Job's life story? and being referred to his sickness and, and what he went we I've, I've heard it from Sunday school days, right? Um, so, uh, and the, there are also, once again, like just like Paul's thorn, um, this, the life of Job is also being uh, misused or, you know, to to once again say that it's okay to tolerate sickness, um, you know, it, it's fine. Uh, but but let's take a closer look at it and see what it says. So a couple of scriptures mentioned here is, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, right, asking to smite on Job. Job 2, 6, 7 says, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. And finally in Job 42 we see, and the Lord restored Job's losses 
when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So this is the 42nd chapter of the book of Job. Now, uh, book of Job chronologically is older than Genesis is what uh, the historians claim right? chronologically. And even his life is much earlier than the life of Abraham, um, chronologically speaking. Okay. Now, another classic, um, how do I say this, misinterpretation, if I may say, uh, is that, okay, Job has, you know, this is the 42nd chapter, and it was in the 42nd chapter that he was blessed and that he regained everything that he lost. Um, that's another misinterpretation. But again, once again, the biblical scholars and historians claim that most of everything what Job endured, all of this happened uh, if, if within the span of a year, right? That's within the span of either 12 months or lesser, okay? So um, we must be very careful in understanding the life of Job and not set his life as a benchmark for everything else to happen and how God functions and whatnot, right? Once again, we have to remember and be very important to say, to interpret the rest of the scriptures in the light of what Jesus did, right? Uh, when, when in his time on, or then what he continues to do. Okay, so we cannot go on saying, uh, you know, Job was sick, Job was sick, Job was sick, Job was sick. So I can also be sick. <laughs> Uh, you know, and blame it on God and whatnot, right? So we see here, it was Satan who struck Job and his family, causing all kinds of calamities and sickness, the source. Right? We cannot blame God for the things that Satan did. However, it is true that God did grant permission for Satan to touch Job, who otherwise was under divine protection since God had made a hedge around him, okay? Please note that, right, in Job 1.10 says, I mean, Satan could not attack Job or lay his hand on Job because God had made a hedge around him. There was a hand of protection, right? There was, he was safe under the wings of God, right? But it was still the devil that caused all the calamities to happen using the elements of weather and nature as well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, as a summary of that question or, or that point, right now is now all of us face these kinds of things, right? Uh, God permits these things to go on even against those who believe in Him, right? Um, he permits. God uses these parts for our training and maturing into Christ-likeness. He calls us to fight the good fight, resist the devil, wrestle against the powers of darkness, quench every fiery doubt, and live overcoming lives. Okay? Um, so, I just want to pause here and uh, just ask, okay, so do you does anybody have any questions you say regarding the life of Job or, um, or, or what we call it? Okay. Okay, um, yeah, let's, let's move on then. So, and once again, we see that, you know, we all know uh, that in the midst of all that happened, Job maintained his integrity and faith in the Lord, right? He stood firm in his devotion to God, right? This endurance of Job is what we are to emulate, okay? Uh, we, we kind of take the, the wrong part and forget this, Right? We always kind of emphasize and magnify everything that he went through, but kind of leave out, you know, the kind of life uh, that he emulated, right? The, uh, the life that he lived with such integrity that he refused uh, to blame God. Uh, he, 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 was, he refused to be offended, um, you know? 
and uh, in, in, to an extent, in a little bit, we see that in the life of David uh, as well. And if you if you have a glance at the life of David from the time he's introduced in, I think, First Samuel 16 onwards, where God talks to Samuel about David, and then from all the way to First Samuel chapter 30, and if you just read everything that happened in David's life, like from Saul trying to kill him uh, time and time again, and then he has to run away from his own people, and then his own people wanted to hand him over to King Saul. He's re rejected by his own people. He's, he's being chased by a king that he loved and looked up as a mentor. And then he goes and joins the Philistines, and you know, and then comes a point where his own the enemy kind of rejects the life of uh, you know rejects David. And then at this point, there were 400 odd men with David who later become known as the mighty men of David, 400 of them that he kind of took care and poured his life into. And all those 400 men now want to kill David because their families have been attacked by the Philistines. In all of this, and it's amazing what David responds and how he how he responds. He says, uh, the Bible says, I think um, in 1 Samuel 30, you can read it. It says, David strengthened himself in the law. Um, so he was, he refused to be offended. Uh, you know, he refused to put the blame and play the blame game as we, as we say. Okay. So the, the, this endurance of Job is what we are to emulate. If there's anything that we can, you know, take from that. Okay. So from the life of Job. Uh, the third frequently uh, asked question is, what does it mean, you know, when scriptures say like, delivering one to Satan? Mm -hmm. Delivering one to Satan. So uh, the two, two scriptures that's mentioned here, one is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 to 5. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present just him who who has so done this deed. So in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so that's one character. Uh, I just want to read two quick scriptures and we we'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Uh, the another two scriptures, two individuals that uh, the Bible talks about is Timothy. It says, of whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Okay, that they may learn. Another scripture says, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort. So, um, now, this is not only used in the New Testament, this line says, delivering one to Satan, okay? If you, once again, in the Old Testament, when, when you read through the book of Judges, uh, especially, you will see time and time again, that God says, you know, I handed them over to the Amalekites. I handed them over to the Philistines. I handed them over to the Midianites. Right? Uh, I'm sure you you would have come across uh, you know uh, sentences, statements like that in the Bible, in the Old Testament as well. So, and and every time God did that was in line to bring discipline to their immorality. Right? Uh, that he wanted to bring discipline to the people of Israel because for time and time again, they had gone into sexual immorality and uh, you know, become very familiar with the lives of the Canaanites, uh, you know, who 
who worshipped their gods, uh, who did things their way, who accepted and embraced the culture of the Canaanites when they were strictly warned not to uh, compromise uh, you know, with their moral values and live a life that is set apart unto Yahweh. So when they did not do that, that's when as a, as a, as a, uh, as he would discipline his people, he would make that statement saying, okay, I'm handing you over. That means he's taking his hand of protection over them for a period. So they learn from their mistakes. And that is exactly what Paul is also doing here in First Corinthians as we just read, is that there is this individual, a person in the church who's been living a sexual immoral, uh, Im, you know, immoral life. And Paul, although he is not present in flesh there, he's heard about this and he is questioning the church. Okay, why haven't you done anything about this? And so Paul is using his apostolic authority and is administering discipline for unrepentant sinful behavior, right? Unrepentant sinful behavior, okay? And so, in a long story, uh, just to paraphrase this, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's asked to, you know, he's taken out of that church, so to speak, um, until he repents and whatnot. And so, the man was being put away from the local church, it says, in one sense, physically, as well as spiritually, okay? So that man, a uh, person with sexual immoral life, was put away from the local church, physically and spiritually. Now, this meant that the protection he would normally have was withdrawn and he was now vulnerable to Satan because of his sin, okay? Satan could then do anything to bring harm uh, in the physical realm. Now, uh, the distance doesn't stop there. And, you know, in 2 Corinthians, he, we, we see that, you know, Paul addresses that this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. Now, he says, okay, at some point, he must have repented from his sins. And then he is not just saying, okay, you know, we can accept him, forgive him. And he's encouraging the church, people of the church saying, okay, forgive him as I have forgiven, right? It says here, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. Okay, so that's what happens when uh, when God is teaching, when he's trying to discipline someone, okay? That's the meaning or the interpretation of that line, delivering to Satan or handed him over. Okay, it's not something physically that's happening. So we as a people of God, right? We are just like it says in, in the book of Job, we have a hedge. God protects us. Okay, we have He protects us with His wings. He's keeping us safe under the shadow of His wings. Right? And of course, yeah, we sin, right? We all do, right? Nobody is perfect, right? But what matters and what is important to Him is are we repenting? Do we have a repentant heart? Or do we just go on and on and on, you know, with our sinful lives, with our habitual sins, our addictions, ignoring the grace of God, saying, it's okay, I don't care, you know. And that is an invitation, um, you know, just opening up the doors and the windows uh, for the enemy to come and attack your life. Okay, so that is the interpretation interpretation of the scripture. Um, and, and you see the same, uh, you know, um, Thing what Paul does and comes to the other two individuals that he was talking about. For example, the second case had to do with these two rebellious men from the church of Ephesus, right? From Ephesians, uh, right? And they are Hymenius and Alexander. Now, Hymenius was teaching, preaching false doctrine that the resurrection was already over, right? Uh, he was preaching false doctrine. And then uh, Alexander opposed Paul speaking things that caused much harm to Paul, right? And so we see here in both cases, Paul exerts once again apostolic authority to release these men from the church and dispose them to Satan. Knowing the apostle's heart, this would have been done with the intent that these men would come to repentance and aligning to the truth. 
But uh, in this case, we have no record of the outcome uh, on this case. We don't know if these two individuals have repented or not. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that's the answer or an explanation to uh, the question, the frequently asked question. Uh, what does this What does this mean? Delivering one to Satan. Mean? Okay. Or what does it mean? And why does it say God handed them over to the Amalekites, etc.? You know, that is the interpretation. Um, moving on to the next frequently asked question. Um, okay, so I just want to pause here and I uh, want to just check with you all. Uh, you guys are still with me and uh, not in cloud nine. Yeah, okay, it's learning something, I hope. Okay. Okay. Um, another frequently asked question uh, from, from the Corinthian church uh, that is again misinterpreted or misunderstood is from this passage from First Corinthians. 17 to 34. Uh, it says, when many who were many were weak, many were sick, and many died prematurely. Many weak, sick, and many died prematurely. And once again, this has led to uh, you know tolerate that okay, weakness is okay, sickness is okay in church, believers is fine, okay, premature death, etc. etc. But when you read the text uh, and understand its uh, context, uh, you see, you know, what it actually means here. So to paraphrase that whole section, uh, and I would encourage you to read this uh, passage, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. Once again, the people of the church of Corinth, they were not taking the table of God, communion, seriously. They did not understand the significance and the importance and the holiness, um, the sacrifice of, uh, of, of, of the Lord's table, right? Uh, they would, uh, it says here in 22, um, you know, what do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? And he understands the significance, Paul, Apostle Paul, right? That it's 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 holy, it's precious. Uh, you know, and he remembers the sacrifice, the cost, the pain, the price that Jesus paid. Uh, but when you read this whole thing, uh, that, you know, the communion was treated as uh, like a party time. Uh, everybody was having fun. It, you know, it's like, like, you know, there was no respect or reverence to, you know, um, to, 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 to communion. Right? And then he says, therefore, from verse 27, who eats, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he, eat, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For we, for we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Okay? So, um, the Corinth church, while being a very spiritual group of people, also had a lot of problems. That had to be addressed, as we all know, right? In the area of moral standards, conduct in church gatherings, and living together as a united community. Part of this was their conduct in celebrating the Lord's table. 
instead of treating this with reverence and doing this with spiritual meaning, this became a time of feasting, eating and drinking in the church gathering. They turned this into a time of having a feast together, which Paul says they, couldn't, they could do at home. What was intended by the Lord to be a time of great reverence and spiritual proclamation of his death, resurrection and soon returning, became more like a lunch feast. Okay, and so, and so that was the reason behind their disciplining or chastisement, as we would call it, right? As to why many were sick, uh, you know, uh, and many were weak, and many who had premature death, is because they did not have reverence to what they were doing to the Lord's table. Okay, so as believers today, we do not have to fierce weakness sickness and premature death because the wrongly because of wrongly participating of the lord's table simply because we have been taught how to do it right right we have been taught how to do it right we know that we must do each time we partake of the lord's table it is not that god is waiting for the smallest mistake to pour down judgment on us rather each time we celebrate the lord's table we bring joy to his heart and fear in the enemy camp. Okay, so that's the um, so that's question four on why there was weakness and sickness and premature death in Church of Corinth. Church of Corinth. Sorry. Okay. Um, another frequently asked question, classic question. Um, Timothy's stomach. We all know this. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, wait, why did you know Timothy have a stomach problem? Um, why wasn't he fine? Um, my, my first explanation being he's having a human body, that's one thing. But also, let's, let's look at it. It says, you know, Paul instructing Timothy uh, no longer drink only water but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Okay. So it is apparent from this verse that Timothy had uh, some sort of recurring stomach problem. Um, and, you know, one of the things uh, that historians claim is because he was traveling, he was on a mission trip right, constantly. He would go from one place to another, to another place. Maybe he had some uh, stomach upset or food poisoning. We don't know. Uh, it, must, it must have been the for a while that Paul took notice and Paul asked him, okay, what have you been doing about your stomach? He's like, no, I've been drinking water, Paul. Uh, and then Paul is like, okay, you know what? Hey, don't drink only water. Just try a little bit of wine. Uh, that might help your stomach uh, you know, and your frequent infirmities. So Apostle Paul recommended the use of wine because of its medicinal value. For Timothy's stomach problem. Hence, we can conclude that it is all right to use natural and med medical remedies while keeping our hearts devoted to God. Okay, so let's look at that very interesting summary. Okay, hence, it doesn't conclude saying, hence, it's okay to keep drinking wine uh, or not. It says, hence, we can conclude that it is all right to use natural and medical remedies. Right, while keeping our hearts devoted to God. Okay, it's okay to take medicines that the doctors prescribe, um, you know, and and while yet keeping our hearts devoted to God and believing for healing, praying for healing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, then another classic thing. Uh, that, that's asked uh, is about Hezekiah's illness, the King Hezekiah in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1 to 7. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1 to 7. Uh, now, again, you see that he was, dis he was disobedient, he was rebellious in some of the things that he did, and God pronounces judgment on him, and then so he was afflicted um, with, um, with ulcers and tumors, etc., etc., okay? So it says here, King Hezekiah was sick and close to death. After hearing the prophet's warning, Hezekiah turns to the Lord and prays. What is happening there is he's repenting. 
right? So repentance is always seems to be uh, uh, the purpose when, uh, like what we just uh, learned as well, you know, when God is teaching you discipline, right? He expects you to repent, right? And the, the beautiful thing is God hears the king's prayer and has the prophet instruct people to make paste out of a lump of figs and place it on boil. Um, Hezekiah is healed and lives for another 15 years. Okay. Uh, obviously, God could have healed Hezekiah without the use of the paste made from figs. Uh, whether the paste made from figs had any healing or medicinal properties for boil, we do not know. Maybe it did, right? But if it does, now we know. Uh, whether it, it did have medicinal value or not, we can affirm that God is not against the use of natural elements through which or along with which his healing is administered to an individual, right? Uh, God could have just said the word and healed him. But also in this, something we learn something different is that he is not against uh, using the natural elements uh, to administer healing as well. Okay, so that's about Hezekiah's uh, sickness. Uh, just want to uh, go down to this section here on um, page 102. Another a very important, uh, you know, frequently asked question is Is sickness the chastening of the Lord? Is sickness the chastening of the Lord? Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 20 to 32 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Same passage. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, now discerning, now discerning the Lord's body. Right? This is the same passage which we just read. Um, another scripture that is mentioned is Hebrews 12, 5, 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Okay, um, so just to, and I would encourage you as always to read the whole scriptures there, is, is sickness the chastening of the Lord? Uh, and we just see that in from the book of, uh, from Hebrews twelve that the Lord chastens whom He loves, and the relationship there is between um, refer there is between the Father and the Son, right? And I'm a father; I have a son. You know, or some, if not all, um, some of us are parents, right, in the class. We want to discipline a child. <laughs> We're not going to say, okay, I'm going to send the sickness over you. So you learn. We, we chasten, we discipline our child. And we do that because of love. But that measure is not by sending this, you know, sickness and whatnot. Right? And if we understand that, um, we will know that the sickness in itself is the Lord, the Lord's chastisement or when he disciplines, he, dis he, he, dis he disciplines out of love for his children so that we will repent, right? So the sickness is not chastening of the Lord. Okay, so that's the, um, the issue. Let's just, uh, I wanna just read this passage and then we'll close the section. The issue of the Lord's chastening is often misunderstood and misrepresented. People fall, people, uh, fall sick and then claim that God made them sick to teach them a deep spiritual lesson. Okay. Um, I just want to pause there. Okay. 
Okay. Um, it says people fall sick and then claim that God made them sick to teach them a deep spiritual um, lesson. Um, and I'm not sure if you come across people like that. Um, I have. And uh, but you will also see at the same time the same people, uh, you know, going to the hospitals uh, to to get to uh, to to be to be made well. Right? The same people who say the sickness is there in them for them to learn a lesson, and um, and they're like, okay, you know, if if that's a lesson, they could let it go on. But you know, instead, you see them going to the hospitals and, and whatnot, right? So that's misunderstood. That's mis misrepresentation uh, that comes with uh, not understanding who the father really is. Okay. Um, so that is the response to uh, to that passage. Another frequently asked questions, and uh, I hope that most of you are still alive. Uh, we'll take a break now. I'll stop the recording and we'll come back to our second session. Okay, I'll see you all in 10 minutes. <laughs>